ما فيش فيرتشوال انا بقى انا كده يا yeah. هاي كاميرا يا ريم شو وانتس تو ويت كده شويه وانا ابتدي انا ممكن ترا ترجعي كاميرا لورا عشان امم I think we can maybe start in one minute, inshallah. Yes, it's up to you. Okay, Dr. Bassiouni, would you, would you like to open your camera, please? I'm going to introduce you. you. So good morning, everybody. Um, I would like to welcome everybody to our plenary for the day today. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Reem Bassiouni. Um, she's going to be talking to us today about um, uh, um, a very important subject. Her title is in a digital age, where is the native speaker? Uh, Dr. Reem Basuni obtained her MA and her doctorate from Oxford University in Arabic linguistics. She had previously taught Arabic language and linguistics at universities in the UK and the US, including Cambridge, Oxford, and Utah. She currently works as the series director for Rutledge Studies in Language and Identity. Her academic books include Functions of Code Switching in Egypt, 20, uh, uh, 2006, Arabic Sociolinguistics, 2008, and Arabic and the Media, 2010. She has published numerous articles on Arabic linguistics topics, including Code 
switching. Language and gender, leveling, register, Arabic and advertisements, linguistics and lit literature, and language politics in the Arab world. On behalf of Nal Tiso and on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to welcome Dr. Reem Basuni. And uh, I, I invite everybody to enjoy this most interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rania. I am really honored to be with you today. Um, I am going to be speaking as a sociolinguist. So my perspective is a little bit different, but also really interesting. Uh, what I would like to start with is speaking a little bit about uh, English. I know that we are all teachers of English, but do we actually have one English? And who of us is the native speaker? I will leave you at the end of this talk with more questions than answers, but I really hope that uh, it, we will brainstorm together and think about issues that could be very challenging, but also very important, especially in the digital age. Uh, if we look at the difference between a dialect and an accent, which I am sure that most of you already know, is that we think of a dialect uh, is a code of a language which is associated with a local area or a community of speakers that share the sociolinguistic variables. A dialect is usually um, defined in relation to another dialect, a language or a standard. And they show distinct characteristic uh, features in terms of their syntax, morphology, semantic features, and phonological features. This is a kind of rough definition of what a dialect is. And of course, it's a little bit fuzzy. The difference between a dialect and a language or a standard language is mostly a difference in perceptions of speakers of different codes. A language usually, as we well know, has an orthography, um, uh, political boundaries, geographical boundaries, uh, a heritage and a history. Why does this happen? Because a language usually has two things, power and resources. These power and resources are available to the speakers or perceived speakers of this language, as Lippi Green says. For non-linguist native speakers of languages, the difference between a dialect and an accent are never clear. For linguists, the difference is in the level of variation. Accents refers to ways of speaking in which variation is in the level of phonological features and not morphological, syntactic, or semantic ones. However, as Libby Green argues, accent is also a loose term and is mainly based on listeners' judgments. Uh, however, given the importance of perceptions, our perceptions, our ideologies, and our attitudes, when we are discussing the differences between dialects, accents, and languages, one has to try to understand what do these terms mean. You will find that most of these terms are really loaded with cultural and social associations. And I'll give you some examples in a minute. When someone speaks English while in Egypt, we say they lost their accent. But you don't actually lose an accent. You can't lose an accent. We all have accents, as Lorzina Libby Green says. But there is always an unmarked variety, assumed, assumed by members of a community to be the standard and the normal way of speaking. Now, this varies from one person to another. So what is normal for me uh, as an, an Alexandrian is very different from what is normal for you as a Kyrene. Uh, so as I said, there is always an unmarked variety assumed by members of a community to be the standard and the normal way of speaking. But the distribution is not equal. Powerful groups usually claim their dialect is the norm. Everything else is marked. So to lose an accent is to speak in the powerful accent. And this is perhaps um, what I would like to start uh, now with you and share my screen.
This is perfect. Okay. Yes, we can see okay. it. Thank can you, you very much. Can you all see me? Okay. That's, yes. right. That's great. So let me just... Okay. Okay. Let me start by saying, as I said uh, before, now we've spoken about how to lose an accent, what is an accent, what's the difference between an accent and the dialect. Now, we would like to discuss the idea of a native speaker. What's a native speaker? A native speaker is someone who speaks perfect language because he has been born in a specific country and he has somehow acquired the language of this country. We say, and this is not correct, that this the native speaker does not have an accent. As I said before, this is not a precise term because a native speaker actually does have an accent. However, our idea, and this is what I want to prove in this uh, presentation, our idea of what a native speaker is, is not very precise. And that's when sociolinguistics could be very useful. Why is it that our idea of a native speaker is not very precise? Uh, because we think of unity of language as a symbol of unity of a nationhood. Uh, we think that languages have boundaries, which is not necessarily always true. And the most important and key word here is our idea of standard varieties. So teachers of English here either teach the American standard or the British standard in schools in Egypt and outside. I would like to tell you that the British standard, according to Milroy, is spoken by 3% of the population of the UK. It is basically uh, the Southern Eastern Midland variety used by the court and around London. So what you are teaching your students as the native speaker of British people is only spoken by 3% of the British people. And that's very important. The same is actually true if you're teaching standard American because standard American is um, basically the level dialects of the Northern Midwest and these are usually, again, not spoken except by the Northern Midwest. So what we are teaching, again, our students as standard American is not spoken by everyone in the States. And that's very important for our students to understand. That doesn't mean that we, when we speak a dialect, do not think that this is the most important dialect, that this is the norm, that this has legitimacy and authority. The native speaker ideology usually authenticates specific groups of speakers and gives them the right to evaluate other speakers and to decide whether their code is legitimate or not. We think that our um, dialect is natural. We think it's normal. We think it's the normal code that people speak. So the first example I would like to give you now is an example of an interview by the American, um, the American actress, Gwyneth Paltrow. Uh, she was interviewed on Friday night with Jonathan Ross speaking of her accent work when playing the main role in the film Emma, as well as the role of Queen Elizabeth in the film Shakespeare in Love. We'll find here that uh, in this specific example, I would like you to notice how the British interviewer thinks about his own dialect or accent or code, and how the actress thinks about the way that she learned this specific British dialect or code. So let me share with you this video. Can you all see? Yes. What do you think of uh, uh, the way we speak over here and how do you master that as an actress? Mm -hmm. Because I know I've heard you do the first time I, I saw you was in Emma many years ago. And okay. I know you made movies for that. And I remember thinking it was a British actress. It was such a oh. accomplished performance in that, in that respect. How do you master that? And, and are there any dialects that you can't get your tongue around? Um, well, I had a really lovely dialect coach and she used to make me do all these crazy exercises because what I didn't realize is that Americans and British accents are so different because we use completely different muscles and tongue placements and all this kind so of thing. So it's really quite technical. It's very technical. So what do the English use more or less than the Americans? I can't remember what she used to say, but she used to have me repeating certain vowels over and over again. and. Then I would feel my mouth going numb, and you guys work your mouths oh, big man. time. <laughs> Is it like yoga for the mouth? Yes, yeah, so I had to do a lot of exercises like that, and very un, un, unattractive exercises. Because you do uh, your yoga person, you know, you, you do, I do you yoga. Keep, you yeah. do, is it yoga or Pilates? What do you do? I do both. I would like to try yoga. I've never tried yoga. Really? And you can keep doing. I did a bit of Pilates once, but you can do it later in life, can't you? Because I'm getting on, I, you know, and I want to get more supple. I'd like to keep supple. Then you should definitely try it. Okay. Are there downfalls or downsides to doing it as you get older? Yoga? Mm-hmm. Where are you going with this? 
<laughs> I'll tell you what worries me, shall okay, I? Okay, yeah. I'm getting the age now where if I get into a certain position, <laughs> I'll move suddenly. Right. I will either break wind, <laughs> or, and I hope you don't mind me sharing this with you, or a little bit of wee will come out. <laughs> do not need to know this. I think you do. <laughs> so if I was to get in, for example, downward facing dog, right. I wouldn't mm -hmm. want to be the person behind me or the person cleaning the mat after me. Okay. <laughs> so, can that... so you actually do need yoga because... Uh, Would that what, help? Yes, because what you do in yoga is you, you pull up the muscles in your pelvic floor, oh. you strengthen those muscles. So especially after having a baby, it's a good thing. Like right. I'm doing mine right now. You want to join me? <laughs> oh, that's a good moment. <laughs> and you're kind of, in some ways, you were like a, a poster girl for that lifestyle in a while, for a while, whether, right. whether knowingly or deliberately or not, because there was also much talk about your macrobiotic oh, right, diet right, and lifestyle. Right. Was that, that was for real? You were really into, into that in a big way? Yeah, that's, that's true. I was uh, very seriously macrobiotic for, I think, four years. What does that actually mean, macrobiotic? I'm not sure what that means. What it means is that you eat... Um, local seasonal organic food you eat food that hasn't been very processed or refined you don't eat sugar you don't eat meat so kind of the way we would have lived a couple of hundred years ago exactly okay. just closer to nature i wasn't intending that <laughs> i really wasn't i like uh on my sandwiches sometimes uh, uh -huh. either hp sauce or daddy right. sauce i know hp daddy's i'm not so familiar with uh alcohol you drink? Oh yeah. What do you like to drink? Red wine. Red wine? Mm -hmm. Good one. Any beers or ales? I like Guinness very much. Ah, you like the Guinness? I like dark beer. Stout. Stout. That kind of thing. Yeah. Mm. What? <laughs> See, look, hmm. that's quite sexy. Watching Guinness drink uh, Guinness is quite hmm. sexy, isn't it? Look that's really nice. You I've had it? such a long day and yeah. that is really hitting the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Ooh, okay. I think I may give you one of those Elizabeth Taylor style kisses that you were discussing. Yeah. yeah. No, and I'll give you a little bit of daddy's sauce. I've done next. I've never drunk it. I tell you, I only drank Guinness once. So I went to the. You know, have you been to Ireland? Have you been to where they make the Guinness? Mm -hmm. It's a really nice day out, isn't it? The Guinness factory and all that. Oh, I've never been there, but oh, yeah. I've been in a pub in Ireland where I they. Wonder. Uh, and I drank a lot of Guinness, and I noticed this. I'm not gonna, obviously, I'm too much of a gentleman to ask you this, but I always farted really badly after. Oh. Okay, so if we look, if you have noticed in this uh, specific video, we'll see that the interviewer spoke about the differences between British or his accent and that of the actress. You will see that, for example, he spoke about yard as different from garden. And then he said to her, you know what's tricky about this? That when you use the right words, you feel, uh, sorry, that you have, that you're not using the right words there. So his idea of British English, English is that British English is actually the right words, as he says. Now, Gwyneth Paltrow replies by saying, you know what's tricky about this? That when you use the right words, you feel like an asshole. And for her, using the right words are basically awkward, strange, and not necessarily what she is. So, uh, the interviewer goes on to discuss all the things that makes people British. And if you notice here, it's not just about the way that you speak, because she can imitate a British accent, but she does not do the, the same thing. She doesn't drink the same kind of beer. She doesn't uh, you know, do the same kind of uh, traditions and cultural uh, things that the British people do. So being a native speaker here does not just entail speaking in a specific way, it also entails doing things in a specific way. And that's the main idea of my talk today. It's the idea that in our digital age, our concept of a native speaker is formulated by certain cultural um, norms, not just linguistic norms. And so when we are hiring teachers, we think that native speaker teachers would be good for our students, but our idea of what a native speaker teacher is not necessarily very precise. Also, when we are uh, grading our students, when we're thinking, for example, of writing, 
we think that we have second language learners and we have native speakers. But our idea of what a native speaker is, is now very challenged, simply because of the globalization that is happening, because students are moving around a lot, because students could be native speakers of more than one language and not just one language. Now, uh, to make this a bit clearer, I would like to discuss with you an example that I think is really fascinating. And it's an example about uh, basically a comic show from, again, uh, the UK. And in this uh, comic show, we have a British. We have actually a British Hindu uh, who grew up in the UK, who grew up in London. He was born in London. He's a native speaker of English. However, the announcer does not consider him a native speaker of English. And that's because he looks different. It seems to her that he, might, he may be um, a Muslim. Uh, he has dark skin. He does not look like the ideo uh, ideological or ideal uh, British in her opinion. Now let's watch this video, which I think is fascinating and see how the native speaker is perceived. Can you see? Can you see the video? Could someone reply? Yes, we can see it. Okay, wonderful. Just the... As an immigrant in Britain, sometimes it's not enough to merely contribute to the economy or prop up the NHS. It's also your job to make British people feel more comfortable with your existence. So, here's my handy guide to being the kind of immigrant British people don't mind so much. First of all, and I cannot recommend this highly enough, be white, really. And if that just isn't possible, try to sound like this guy. Good day. Ahir hasn't chosen to be white, but he has gone and got himself a lovely little aristocratic accent. See how he sounds like Mish, but better? Now, as Catherine pointed out, I did forget to choose to be white, which can be tricky. Catherine has loads of tiny brown bits on her, but they're known as freckles and are associated with being cute. Whereas I have one massive brown bit on me, and that's known as skin, and is associated with being see it, say it, sorted. It is best not to be associated with a group that's into terrorism and popular consciousness. Though, remember, times do change. <laughs> Next. English has to be your only language. British people are suspicious of anyone who knows more than one language. <laughs> and in a way, why have you got a secret code that only you and your friends can understand? It's actually kind of childish if you think about it. Next up, in Britain, it's very important that you never be seen publicly sober. Am I right, Felicity? You're right there, mate. They practically forget us Aussies are even immigrants because we're white, we can only speak English, and we fucking love a drink. 
Nothing says useful contribution to society like ordering breakfast beers on a Tuesday. Huh? Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Why are Australians mainly white? It can be religious, but it's best to stick to Christianity. Or one that's so confusing as to appear benign. For example, my family are Hindu, a belief system with a long and complex history, which in Britain is mainly used to market things to vegans. Mm, what tips are here? Looks like even solving British racism is being outsourced to India. Am I right, guys? I'm from East London. Yeah, but where are you originally from? West London. <laughs> Jagerbomb? <laughs> <laughs> so remember, be white, only speak English, drink alcohol, and try not to be Muslim. If you followed each of these points correctly, then congratulations. You're being the kind of immigrant British people don't mind so much. Even you are here. I am British. <laughs> That's the spirit. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, this is Won Ho Chung. So, <clears throat> Won Ho, thanks for coming out and uh, being our special guest, our special weapon, if you will. Um, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to the beautiful people of Dubai? 안녕하세요. 나는 이름 나는 한국 사람이요. 나는 이름 원호 인석 일봉 영원청. I have no idea what he said, but uh, here's what I'd like to do. Um, I'm just going to give you the microphone, and I'd like you to entertain the people of Dubai. Maybe do a song and dance, if you will. Is that okay? Do you guys want to hear Wan Ho Chung? Watch him, okay. Wan Ho Chung, everybody. Okay, just go. You'll be fine. Just go ahead and go. Just go ahead in the front. Right in the front. One whole song, everybody. عليكم <تصفيق> يا أخي طلع هذا شعره كيف واقف. سو قلت له مش فاهم يعني حلو ولا مش حلو؟ قال لي لا مرة مرة حلو. على كل حال، for all those who are non-Arabic speakers, I do apologize, but there's a Showtime initiative to launch stand-up comedy in Arabic. Hence, my presence on stage. So yeah, big ups. So uh, anyways, I'll introduce myself again. My name is Juan Ho. No joke. I swear. What shall we name him? Juan Ho, because it's funny in the States. It'll make for good comedy. Anyways, my name is Juan Ho. Abui Kuri. Umni Vietnamie. Waish kul hayati bil Urdun. Yes. Uh, anyone from Jordan? <laughs> Woo! Yahya Asalku. Anyways, I kid into am tatallaw alay, wa am tihku. Hada shiklo zay wusalsalam dablaj. Okay, now this last example of one hole is really fascinating. It's fascinating because I would like to ask all of you now, uh, as uh, teachers of English, do you think that one hole is a native speaker of Arabic or not? I personally think he's a native speaker of Arabic. He doesn't have any Arabic blood in him, um, as he said, where his mother comes from and where his father comes from. He may not be an Arab, but he is a native speaker of Arabic. He grew up all his life in Jordan. He doesn't know any other country. So, but Arabs are not convinced that he's a native speaker of Arabic. If you, I would like you to watch this uh, program at your leisure later on, and you will notice that in most, uh, in, in the rest of the program, he's saying how people write comments on um, Facebook saying, wow, you speak Arabic better than us. Now, if I make this judgment, this is an evaluation. If I say you speak English or you speak Arabic better than me, it means I am a legitimate 
authoritative figure that can judge your language. And this can only happen if I think of myself as more of a native speaker than you are. And that's exactly how the Arabs think of one who. They think that because of his name, because of the way he looks, they are more of native speakers than he is. And that's exactly the point that I would like to discuss with you today. In fact, would you accept one who as a teacher of Arabic? And as someone who even uh, exactly the same with British uh, with British uh, people, that's exactly the example we gave before. So yes, he is a native speaker of Arabic. He can be a teacher of Arabic. He is someone that you could uh, trust to give students the intuition of a native speaker. And yet in most cases, he's not the first person we will hire as a native speaker. He's not the first person we may think about as teaching our uh, kids Arabic. Why? Because of our ideologies of what a native speaker looks like. Same like with the, in the first video. And because of our ideologies of what a native speaker um, should be. In most cases, uh, the uh, European ideology of a native speaker is someone who does only speaks one language. He's very authentic, he only speaks English. So, and that perhaps is also why we have this idea in our classes of speak only one language, speak only in English. I don't understand any other language. A, a very good teacher would say that to their students. In reality, there are very few people in the world now who would speak only in one code or one language. I mean, we're speaking about Europe and the, uh, the, United and the United States, but think about other parts of the world. Most people are actually bilingual or trilingual. That's the norm in other parts of the world. So if we are asking uh, people to become native speaker by only speaking one language and having one identity and having one country, we are not speaking about uh, the recent or the digitized age we're living in now. Uh, we need, yeah, definitely we need to change our uh, mindset. Uh, I'll give you an example now of actually a teacher of English uh, who wrote her research about Qatar. And Qatar, as you well know, is a very is a super diverse community. Anne Nabel uh, says she is teaching English in Qatar, and she states that Qatar's population, which is 2.2 million, has expats that are 1.5 million. Now she thinks it's very challenging to actually decide who's a native speaker of English and who's not. When she's teaching composition, for example. Um, she's not sure who do we consider a native speaker and who do you consider a second language learner. Nabel argues that native speaker is a defining term in writing courses in which there is a first language writer and a second language writer. And these ideological constructs of the multilingual learner only restrict our full picture in which the linguistic situation is fluid and non-binary. She argues that in order to understand the linguistic situation in a place like Doha, we need to apply the work of Blomart, for example, who works on super diversity and linguistic landscape. Now, this kind of super diversity creates problems for teachers because teachers are, are teaching one kind of English, a standard variety. Um, and the English that they are telling their students, perhaps that this is the English spoken in, the, in, in Britain, which is not the case, as we said, it could be spoken by 3% of the population of Britain, but not by all the British and the same with uh, Americans. Now, uh, she says, for example, that uh, if you're examining first year's uh, composition courses in the US universities in Doha, you will find that in this era that we're living, it's very difficult to decide who is a native speaker of English. She has one student, for example, in her class uh, in a US university who has grown up, has be, uh, he speaks English only at home. His mother is Spanish, his father is French, and he lives in Doha. How would you consider this student? Would you consider this student a native speaker of which language? These are all examples to show you, um, as uh, Nabel argues, citing uh, Blumert and Rapton, that languages are now denaturalized. Few speakers operate in one discrete linguistic form, and static categories cannot persist in the face of these new challenges. The challenges in teaching are even, or even understanding multilingual speakers is that as naval posits, we still seem to be locked into a predominantly American culture of theorizing and doing composition studies where the categories of lang first language, second language, native speaker, and so on, continue to constrain our thinking and our impact." End of quote. Now, I would like all of you to think with me uh, and try to answer these questions. Where is the native speaker in our age? 
how do we hire and evaluate teachers, considering them native speakers or non-native speakers? If we have multilingual teachers, how do we consider them as native speakers or non-native speakers? If we have uh, teachers that do not speak standard uh, English, but they are native speakers of, of Britain, how do we, uh, for example, evaluate them? Can non-native speaker teachers be legitimate authoritative figures in judging grammaticality and language use? Because to be honest with you, English is not just spoken in uh, the UK and the US and Australia, as we saw in the video, English is spoken in Africa and in China and in India. So who is the native speaker in that case? And who decides which variety of English to teach? Are all native speakers equal? Because we know in sociolinguistics that um, no, not all native speakers are equal because not all people are equal. There are social uh, categories of people. And because of this inequality in our world, native speakers are also not equal. And native speakers of English are also not equal. And I'm sure that all the teachers here will agree with me in this statement. Uh, sociolinguists uh, established that there is unfortunately no equality between people and no equality between languages or dialects or accents. There are some people that are more powerful, therefore their accent or dialect is more powerful. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure uh, talking to all of you and I'm uh, very ready to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bassiouni. It's an excellent uh, thought-provoking uh, presentation, um, uh, broaching many subjects. I have been manning the Q&A. I have a couple of questions for you, if I may. Uh, the first question actually is from me, if I may. <laughs> I'm going to use my power here. <laughs> what about um, issues like pe people being uh, bi or tri, uh, a dialectal, you know, having the ability to speak more than one dialect. Exactly. Any thoughts on that, please? Sure. I mean, most people are. I think uh, Dr. Rania is, is, this is a very good question. Yes, most people are. I mean, most people could speak more than one dialect. Uh, I can tell you, for example, I come from Alexandria. I don't like to change the way I speak, but people could mark what I speak as Alexandrian. But there are people who are coming from the South that could speak Kyrene very well for example, coming from the south of Egypt. So they have two dialects in that case. And the, the, I can, and I'm sure that teachers of English, for example, coming from the UK, who come from the north, have, when they come to Egypt, to uh, you know, teach their students in standard British English, which I said is spoken by 3.5%. And that's not just me saying that this is Milroy as well. So, I mean, that's the disparity that we have. We as sociolinguists describe, we like to describe what is happening. We don't prescribe, but teachers, they have to prescribe because you have to choose. You have to choose one dialect to teach. I think perhaps what would help is introducing our students to the diversity, saying, okay, we're speaking about English. By the way, surprise, surprise, English is not just a native speaker of people in, in these kind of uh, white countries as we call them in sociolinguistics. It is also the native uh, language of people in India in some countries in Africa. It's, you know, so that will give them a little bit of diversity. Yeah. And also, also make them more comfortable speaking in any way they want because there isn't yeah. one good, correct dialect of English. Yeah, and I would like to add also that, uh, you know, with the uh, with Muselsalat and uh, Turkish uh, Muselsalat yeah. and, and being dubbed in, uh, in Syrian Arabic, everybody now speaks and understands Lebanese and senior Arab, senior exactly. Syrian Arabic, you know. Yeah. When I first came to Egypt, people would uh, look at me and think I'm weird because I have this accent. But now they accept me because, you know, they know what Syrian Arabic is and Lebanese Arabic is. So another question in the chat, actually very interesting question. Uh, they're talking about if whether you were saying today also applies to modern standard Arabic and teaching that to native speakers, you know, of course, they're, they're not learning, learning the native uh, dialect, but what do you think of that? Uh, I think this is a big issue. I didn't want to get into that since we're speaking about <laughs> English today, but we can get into it and we have some time. Uh, yes, I think there is a big problem with uh, standard Arabic. There is also ideology. Same with, uh, I mean, same with standard English. The only difference is that standard Arabic is not the spoken dialect of any country, not even 3% of the population. You know, while standard English may be spoken by 3% of the population, standard Arabic isn't. Uh, does that mean we don't speak, we don't teach standard Arabic? We teach it, but we don't. We have to tell our students, surprise, surprise, you're not going to find anyone speaking in this way. But you need to understand this way and be able to practice this way. But I think that's yeah. I mean that adds more complexity to the situation in the Arab world. For yeah. example, I don't know what, whether one who 
uh, master standard Arabic. I guess he does because he grew up in Jordan. So I, I would say he does, but that would be um, another very important issue. Uh, the other thing that uh, you, you brought my attention to, Dr. Rania, is exactly what you mentioned now, that people comment on your accent when you came to Egypt or, or your dialect when you came. And you know, uh, the ideology of the native speaker is that they speak in the normal way and that's the, the way, and everyone else is speaking differently, but that's not true because there are different people and everyone thinks that the way is the normal way. Same like uh, we had this interview with Gwyneth Paltrow when he was telling her the right way of speaking, but for her, that's not the right way. She said, this would be very awkward for me. I have two other in very interesting questions coming up here. Uh, the first one is basically, uh, do you think, I'm gonna try to rephrase that, like uh, uh, the gentleman we saw from Korea, you know, uh, would be able to teach Arabic in a, in, a, in a school or in a, you know, whatever context? Yes, for sure. I mean, if he was, let's imagine he was trained as an Arabic teacher, you would be, would he be hired? That's the, the, <laughs> yes. That's he more. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, the next question actually is basically um, the, the debate, current debate. You know, when you see the advertisements in any school or any, and this is not in Egypt, only everywhere in the Arab world, uh, uh, native speakers only apply for, for positions or posts of, of teaching English. What would you say to these people, you know, um, administrators, school owners, uh, university <laughs> people who are universities, which are hiring, you know, uh, you know, professors and instructors, what do you think? What would you say to them? <laughs> Okay, well, I think uh, from my perspective as a sociolinguist, this should not be uh, allowed to write this <laughs> even in an ad, because we think that, I mean, again, this is already showing that there are some people who have more power and who have more legitimacy. And so as a sociolinguist, we think we should not really have this at all. Sometimes, of course, institutions are also commercial. Mm. You know, unfortunately now, education has become very commercial. It's now about what the student wants, what the parents of the students want. And some parents may think they have the ideology of a native speaker of English and their ideology is very similar to the ideology perhaps of the woman who was interviewing the uh, British Indian. So they might think, okay, well, I'm paying all this money. I would like to have a teacher that looks like that because that's my idea of what a native speaker uh, looks like. So that the commercial part in education is of course a little bit wobbly and, and fuzzy and, and caused, causes a lot of problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, ne the, ne the, uh, the question also here is basically, uh, what do you think is going to happen in the future when we talk about, you know, maybe 20 years from now or, or 30, where are we heading? Um, where are we heading? I think it's very, it's going to be very difficult to find the monolingual native speaker uh, in, for our uh, classes. I think it will be, we will have to um, face the truth in this globalized age, in this digitized age, and, and see that there are different ways of speaking English. We have to be more accepting. Uh, I think it's already, uh, there is a wake up call already in, in the US and the UK of having to accept this. I mean, we're speaking about English, let alone French, where you have all these countries again in Africa that speak French as a native language. So yes. um, we have, I mean, we do, we will have to be more accepting, whether we like it or not. Um, another question, basically, <laughs> okay, so I'm going to try to, uh, okay, rephrase this. So, you know, like there are people who live in a country, okay, for 20 years, 30 years, but they refuse to accept or adapt the, 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 the native uh, dialect or the native whatever. And they insist, for example, a, a foreigner living in Egypt for 30 years and they don't speak Arabic or... Uh, do not feel comfortable speaking Arabic. And I, I know for a fact that um, uh, there is the ego permeability theory that was once uh, very, very popular about it's, a, it's an effective thing. It's, a, it's an emotional, mental barrier that some people put against learning a new dialect or adapting to a new uh, uh, way of speaking. What do you think of that? What makes people live in a country like the Chinese in America? They live in little China, for example, or in any area, and they refuse to speak English. They spend their whole life speaking only their native language, the motherland or the fatherland. What do you think? Why would something like that happen? 
Okay, uh, let me, I'm trying to see the questions also on the chat and I see one question here about, uh, do I think native speakers are, are good teachers? That's not what I'm trying to say at all. Of course, to become a good teacher, you have to be trained as a teacher. We're speaking about people who are trained as teachers, but who also are native speakers, not, not just any native speaker, because of course, any native speaker cannot teach a language, for sure. So we're speaking, of course, about pe people who are trained as teachers. So for example, imagine that one who is trained as a teacher of Arabic, would you hire him? That was my idea, not yeah. just that he's a native speaker. So just yeah. to uh, clarify this point. And also, uh, as Dr. Ola is saying, yes, of course, modern standard Arabic is very important uh, for communication, uh, interdialectical communication, just to make sure about these two points. I didn't see all the questions, but Rania will, will tell me about mm -hmm. them. Now, in, in the, issues that you, the issues that you're talking about are very important now for sociolinguists. And the reason is that we think that people who do not feel the need there are two issues. If you are an immigrant, the United, the United Nations says that you have the right to use your own language. Okay, so I cannot force people to only speak the language of the country. So let's imagine you immigrated to Germany and then Germans say you can only speak in German. Now, according to the human rights declaration, this is not allowed. You are allowed to speak your own native language. So this is the first, that doesn't happen always, but that's the case. Now, I could stop you from speaking your own language in different ways, by not giving you jobs if you have a, if you have a certain accent, by um, refusing to teach your, your own language in schools. There are different ways where which I can actually sort of uh, use language as a, in a power game. Yeah. Uh, there are also people who argue that if you don't use, like for example, if you are a Spanish speaking in the US, there are two arguments. There is the argument that you did not integrate because language is a kind of integration and that could be because the community does not allow you to integrate or it could also be that you are just trying to uh, preserve the diversity within your community. Yeah. So there are um, different ways of looking at this in sociolinguistics and it's a big topic. And now specifically it's really important because there is so much super diversity throughout the world. Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, anyway, right. um, I yeah. think we have covered most of the questions in the Q&A um, and a lot of thank yous and a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, praise about uh, broaching this very interesting subject, this very topical issue, and it's uh, basically added, uh, you know, much to, uh, to our thoughts and our, um, you know, maybe we can all go back to read up and uh, there's a request actually for the uh, maybe links to the videos that you shared with us. Sure, Some people are sure. quite interested in the links, you know. Um, and uh, in the, at the end of this excellent, uh, interesting, thought-provoking plenary, so I would like to thank you, Dr. Reem, for basically being with us today and, uh, you know, basically shedding light on this very important topic. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was my honor. Thank you so much. And good luck. Uh, and that's a great conference. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you very much. I hope to see you again, inshallah, next year with us. Thank I you. hope so. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very Bye. much. Bye-bye.